Hello, I am Deb Van Dyke Reese, Director of the Nebraska Court Improvement Project, and I want to welcome you to the 2018 Legislative Webinar. Before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the CIP website within the next week. Please mute your phones, which can be done by pressing star six. There is a chat box at the bottom of the left corner of your screen to ask questions. And at the top right corner, there is the legislative chart, chart available for download. Lastly, on April 27th from noon to one Central Standard Time, we will be hosting part two of the legislative webinar to follow up on legislation passed this session. Now I will hand it off to Mary Ann Harvey and Matt Lewis, project specialists from the Nebraska Court Improvement Project. Thank you. Hi everyone, this is Mary Ann from Court Improvement, um, and I'm gonna start off the session, the webinar today, just by going over um, how a bill becomes a law. Um, and so you can see on your screen, um, this was provided by the Nebraska legislature, and I, it's actually a really helpful um, description of how a bill becomes a law in Nebraska. Um, so bill introduction happens the first 10 days of the legislative session, and that ended last Thursday. Um, and there are about 450 bills that were introduced in this session. After bill introduction happens, the reference committee refers um, each bill to the committee, the appropriate committee for hearings. Um, and one of the really kind of cool and interesting things about the Nebraska legislature is that every bill gets a hearing um, in front of a committee. <clears throat> and that's different than in other states. And those committee hearings have actually already started. Um, you'll notice in the chart uh, that we're referring to throughout that we have the dates of committee hearings for the bills if, um, if they've been set. And at those committee hearings, the senator will introduce the bill and then different uh, people are allowed to come and speak on the bills. Um, and a proponent, a neutral, or an opponent um, manner and those are open hearings and so if there's a bill you're interested in testifying on um, it would be possible for you to do so by going to the hearing. Um, the committees then will vote on the bill and they'll vote to either send it to general file with an amendment if they want to or they can take no action um, on the bill which means that then later on they could come back and take a vote um, to send it to general, fi general file or they can indefinitely postpone the bill, which means they won't take any action on it um, at this time. Once the bill gets to general file, that's where there's the full legislative debate. So the entire legislature gets to debate the bill and then vote on it. Um, and at this stage, it's possible to add amendments to the bill um, and have a vote on those as well. Um, 25 votes are needed to move the bill forward onto select file. So select file, the next stage, um, in this process allows for more debate on the bill and then more amendments to be added as needed. So it's just kind of a second round of debate. Um, if the bill passes select file, then it goes on to final reading. Final reading is where the clerk of the legislature actually reads the bill aloud to the floor and no amendments um, are allowed to be made uh, at this stage. However, um, the bill could be sent back to select file if um, if amendments need to be made. So at this point, 25 votes will send the bill to the governor for signature. Um, however, if there's an emergency clause, which would mean the bill would go into effect immediately, um, that would need 33 votes. Um, if, the, if the bill calls for something to go on the ballot, and I know that there are some things this year that um, would ask for certain things to be placed on the ballot, um, for a general election ballot, you need 30 votes. For a primary or special election ballot, you would need 40 votes. Um, once the bill gets to the governor, he has five days to sign the bill, excluding Sundays. And then he can also um, veto the bill or line item veto, which would mean he would veto out certain sections of the bill. And for the legislature to override his veto, um, it would take 30 votes. So the bill then becomes a law three calendar months after it's passed, or after the end of the session, um, unless there's an E-clause, which means it would go into effect immediately upon signature. 
So now we're going to move to talking about um, some of the bills that were presented this session. And I'm going to start out with LB714, which was a Senator Howard bill. Um, and this provides a procedure and factors for judges to consider for judicial emancipation of a minor. Um, and this bill has a hearing in the Judiciary Committee actually tomorrow, uh, January 24th. Um, so the certain things about the bill include that the minor must be at least 16 and living apart from his or her parents or married. Um, the minor would file in the district court of the county of their residence and notice must be served on their parents or a legal custodian. And then there are certain um, factors that the court shall consider and that in these include um, whether the minor is able to support him or herself without financial assistance, whether the minor is sufficiently mature and knowledgeable to manage his or her affairs, whether emancipation is in the best interest of the minor, and then if emancipation is granted, it emancipates the minor for all purposes, including um, contractual obligations and indebtedness, acquiring property, litigation or settlement, consenting to medical, dental, or psychiatric care, enrolling in school or college, and establishing his or her own residence. Um, any support at that point that would be owed to the minor by a parent would be terminated. Um, <clears throat> emancipation, however, does not affect the status of the minor for purposes of any provision of law which governs matters related to juvenile, to the juvenile code. So I read that to mean that um, if a minor is emancipated, that doesn't mean that they're an adult for purposes of any criminal activity. Um, they would still be charged um, in a juvenile court for any delinquency acts or anything like that. Um, emancipation can be voided on filing by any person or public agency if the minor becomes indigent or if the judgment was obtained by fraud. Okay, the next bill that we're going to go on to, um, there's two bills that are kind of related. Those are LB836, again, Senator Howard. Um, and then LB982, which is Senator Morfeld. And both of these bills provide for minors' consent to certain mental health services. Um, and both have been sent to the Judiciary Committee but are not scheduled for hearing at this point. Um, <clears throat> and there's just a couple of differences between their two bills. Senator Howard's bill says that a psychiatrist um, and other mental health providers can provide for mental health and drug addiction treatment to a minor without parental consent if they determine that the minor is knowingly and voluntarily seeking the services and the services are clinically indicated. The treatment may only be for six sessions without parental consent or notification unless um, stopping that would be detrimental to the minor's well-being or trying to get consent would be detrimental to their well-being. Um, that does not include certain services like medication unless the youth is 16 or older or when the parent guardian consent is not reasonably available or would be detrimental. Um, so this would allow a youth to consent to medication if they're 16 or over. Um, LB 982, Senator Morfeld's bill, just says that any person 18 years of age or older may consent to mental health services without parental consent. Um, so kind of similar, but Senator Howard's bill goes into a little more detail and also allows someone who's uh, younger than 18 to consent to mental health services. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to um, LV845, which is Senator Breezy. Uh, and this bill basically says that disability of a parent shall not serve as a basis for denial of custody. Um, and this has been sent to the Judiciary Committee and is set for a hearing on February 2nd. Um, so the bill kind of lays out what that means. So it says that disability shall not serve as a basis for denial or restriction of custody when it is otherwise in the child's best interest to be with a parent. Um, and the moving party, the party, the party alleging the parent's disability, um, would have to show that there's a detrimental effect on the child and prove that by clear and convincing evidence. Um, at that point, the parent would then have the opportunity to demonstrate that with supportive parenting services, um, any concern about their parenting would be alleviated. Um, the court may then require those services um, and may put the bill up for review. So 
or not the bill, the, the decision up for review. So they could set the, the case for some more um, reviews going forward just to make sure that the supportive parenting services are alleviating any issues that were a concern. Okay, so the next bill that I'm going to talk about is LB 863, um, also a Senator Howard bill, and this adds a ground for termination of parental rights. Um, so to the termination of parental rights statute, it adds that the court may terminate a parent's rights if a child is three or under and has been in out-of-home placement for a cumulative total of six months or longer and the parent has substantially neglected or willfully refused to remedy the circumstances that cause the child to be in out-of-home placement, including refusal to participate in services. So this is a big change, I think, for people who know the termination of parental rights statute. At this point, um, there would only be a filing for termination of parental rights at six months if there's been abandonment of the child, which would mean um, like no contact basically with the child, or if the child has been in out-of-home care for 15 out of 22 months. So this really changes um, the ability to terminate a parent's rights much earlier for young children who are in out-of-home care. Um, and this has been set for hearing in the Judiciary Committee on February 2nd as well. Now I'm going to turn it over to Matt to talk about some bills. Okay, so I'm going to be going over a couple of bills that uh, mostly relate to um, trials and, and hearings in court as well as a couple of school disciplinary measures uh, that are up uh, from this session. So the first one is um, LB 930, which is Senator Hansen. Uh, this bill proposes that no statement, admission, or confession made by a youth as a result of custodial interrogation um, can still be admissible against a youth unless that youth's parent or guardian uh, was present and also uh, knowingly and voluntarily waives uh, the right to remain silent uh, with the youth um, as uh, a part of that um, interrogation um, or investigation. So uh, the current standard um, is as much for juveniles like it is for adults that um, as long as the person that is um, being uh, subject to the custodial interrogation, as long as they uh, voluntarily, voluntarily and, and knowingly waive um, and also uh, cooperate thus with the uh, interrogation and investigation, um, that those statements can be used against them during their hearing and during their court proceedings, but this would require that the parent guardian or, you know, whoever the, uh, the um, whoever speaking on behalf of the juvenile uh, during their court hearing would, would also have to waive um, for that. So this is subject to the public safety exception of Miranda v. Arizona. Um, and so a, if a clear and present danger exists and officers have a reason to believe that the person being interrogated has the ability to end the emergency, um, they don't require uh, any sort of uh, waiver or anything like that in order to cooperate during the, that, that hearing. So um, it provides also uh, a definition of custodial interrogation that, that simply just reflects that which is held by the Nebraska State Constitution and U.S. Constitution, which is um, basically a standard of not free to leave. So. Um, and the next one is LB 981 from Senator Baker. Uh, this amends portions of 43247 to allow for use um, that have been adjudicated uh, as within the provisions of the juvenile code to remain subject to the jurisdiction of the juvenile court for the purposes of enforcing court orders um, and, and sort of plans going forward as long as um, that individual and his or her legal counsel consent to uh, jurisdiction remaining until the person is the age of 21 rather than uh, just the, the simple age of majority. Um, so this does allow for the termination of jurisdiction um, between the age of majority and the age of 21 if that consent is not continued by the juvenile or uh, their attorney. Uh, they could submit themselves and, and agree to jurisdiction until the age of 21, but um, if they decided the situation changed, um, as it looks like it's written now and as I'm understanding it, and they could back out of that um, uh, after the age of majority is reached. So, um, LB 990 uh, is Senator Wayne. Uh, this creates a new offense under the Nebraska Criminal Code uh, that would allow for a person under the age of 25 who knowingly possesses a firearm to be charged with possession of a firearm by a, quote, prohibited juvenile offender, end quote. Those are uh, the Bill's words, not mine. Um, where that person had been previously adjudicated in juvenile court uh, for one of a series of acts. Um, the first would be an act that constituted a felony or misdemeanor domestic violence offense uh, if they're currently a fugitive. 
uh, if they're subject to domestic violence or sex assault protection orders, uh, all those things would be applicable. Um, this would not apply to their special provisions for people that are members of ROTC or the National Guard or you know service members or anything like that. Um, they would not be charged with possession of a, of a firearm by a prohibited juvenile offender. Um, the, that person can also make a petition to the court for exemption from this, this section prior to reaching the age of 25. Um, the bill gives the procedure for making the petition uh, for exemption and also findings necessary for a grant of that um, exemption and uh, as well as some applicable definitions. And the, um, the findings necessary to either deny or grant the waiver mostly depend on, you know, acts of violence, you know, previous acts of violence and things like that, um, you know, almost a propensity to commit those acts further uh, that need to be looked at and, you know, the behaviors and, and approach by the, the person in court that's seeking the exemption. So um, I'm going to turn it back over to Marianne for one more of hers, uh, and then I'll be back with you shortly. Okay, so the next bill that I wanted to talk about, my next and last bill, um, is LB 998, which is uh, Senator Walls. Um, and this would create what they're calling the Collaborative School Behavioral and Mental Health Program. Um, it's been referred to the Education Committee, but um, when I checked earlier today, it had not yet been set for a hearing. Um, and so the first thing that this bill does um, is create a fund to support this, um, this Collaborative School Behavioral and Mental Health Program. Um, and the fund must have three million six hundred thousand dollars in it before um, this could go into effect and what it would do is provide each ESU so educational service unit with a social worker to train teachers and other personnel um, that social worker would also be able to work with parents schools behavioral and mental health care providers and other community resources in order to provide timely effective and family-centered services um, they also may administer screening tools, assessment tools, advocate for appropriate services for students and families, and maintain case files, as well as create agreements with specific referral sources. Um, three years after implementation, and like I said, it wouldn't be implemented until they've raised the requisite money, um, each ESU then shall determine the cost of having the social worker on staff. Um, and if, if they choose to, they can continue uh, and the cost then would be divided between the ESU, um, any of the participating school districts, the general fund, and private donations. Um, it also directs the ESU coordinating council to administer the program, so they would have to hire a coordinator. Um, and that person would create requirements for initiatives, solicit program plans, ID evidence-based best practices, and complete an annual evaluation of the program. Back to Matt. Okay, so I'm going to talk next about um, LB 999 and 1056 kind of together because they both sort of relate to um, student discipline in schools and, and how the school responds to that and also how they document all that stuff. So um, 999 is uh, Senator Vargas and Senator Wayne, um, and it changes provisions relating to the Student Discipline Act, uh, specifically in, in 79-256. Generally, the, the Student Discipline Act is the purpose of the, the act is to assure the protection of all elementary and secondary school students' constitutional right to due process and fundamental fairness within the context of an orderly and effective educational process. And I just ripped that straight from their, their, um, their wording in the, in the statute. But um, 999 looks to broaden some terms uh, related to mandatory reassignment uh, for students that are being mandatorily reassigned to uh, other schools to include just transfers from the student's original school for any reason, not just disciplinary reasons. Uh, it also caps the amount of time after a suspension before a written notice must be provided to the student, as well as the parent and guardian detailing the grounds for the suspension, um, to not exceed 48 hours. So it was previously mandated that it is within 24 hours or uh, such time as it is reasonable, reasonably necessary to produce the notice, but there's, there's no final cap on that time. So the bill proposes a 48-hour cap, hard cap on you know, getting written notice to a student under any circumstances. Uh, it also requires each school district to develop a plan and adopt guidelines for making schoolwork and assignments available without requiring expelled students to attend alternative programs for expelled students. Um, and to make these alternative program, alternatives to the alternative programs uh, readily available to students um, and, and make sure that they know about them so that they can take advantage of them rather than going to the alternative programs for expelled students that schools have. Uh, it requires each school district to accept all non-duplicative and grade appropriate credits earned while on expulsion. 
Uh, and then it also mandates several timelines related to misconduct. So a two-day suspension, um, a two-day, uh, two-school day decision window for discipline recommendations after uh, an alleged student misconduct. Um, it also requires the superintendent to recommend a, uh, an appointment of a hearing examiner two days after a hearing request related to an incident is made by a parent or their guardian. Um, prior to that hearing, the student to provide documentation and statements about the incident to the student, uh, the parent, or their representative 48 hours prior to the hearing. Uh, and then a recommendation following that hearing must be made 10 days after the hearing. So it just sets a bunch of hard deadlines around um, the hearings related to student, you know, sort of misconduct in school. Uh, 1056 uh, by uh, Senator Hansen um, just looks at trying to make sure the data related to um, student disciplinary measures uh, and law enforcement referrals are included and collected underneath the um, overall state school board, board of education, um, so that they have all that stuff all in one place. So the data that they're looking to collect specifically are the number of students sent to ISS and OSS uh, once or more than once is two separate categories. Um, students expelled in total uh, and then also the number of expulsions related to zero tolerance policies. Uh, the days and the range of days missed by students uh, due to out-of-school suspension and expulsion, students subject to mandatory reassignment uh, for disciplinary reasons, the number of students referred to law enforcement officers and uh, school resource officers for school-related activities, students ticketed or arrested or detained for school-related activities or school-sponsored act activities and athletic events, um, the uses of restraint in schools, both mechanical and physical, uh, but then also looking at uh, how often and when and what incidents uh, room confinement is used at a school. And then also just looking basically at are school resource officers available at schools, if so, how many. Um, and then this data has to be provided by the individual school districts to the State Board of Education uh, with the ability to disaggregate by race, ethnicity, gender, grade level, uh, any identified disability, uh, anything like that. So uh, that's sort of those two together. And then the uh, last bill that I'm going to go over is LB uh, 1112, and this was um, submitted by Senators Vargas, uh, Kristen, and Senator Penzian Brooks. Um, and this just re uh, this visits um, looking at YRTC placements um, and uh, proposes that a youth shall not be placed at the YRTC unless it is uh, quote urgent and of immediate need. Uh, the youth shall not be detained unless it is a matter of community safety. This is defined later in the bill as a, uh, a serious threat to the physical safety of community persons. But it also allows uh, for the, the youth to be detained at the YRTC to ensure appearance at their next hearing, uh, but they must have had a demonstrated failure to appear within the last 12 months in order to, to do that. Um, it does say that a child 12 and under shall not be placed in detention under any circumstances. Uh, there are um, several prohibitions on the placement of a youth in detention, uh, and that is uh, proposed, and that's a, as a means of allowing a parent or guardian to avoid his or her responsibility, as a means of punishing, uh, treating, or rehabilitation, so this can't be the grounds for detention at a YRTC, um, providing convenient administrative access to youth is not a, a reason to detain, uh, to facilitate further investigation or interrogation, or because of the lack of a more appropriate facility. All those things would now be prohibited as reasons for placing in a YRTC uh, under uh, 1112. And then lastly, uh, it, hold, it uh, allows for funds from community-based aid to be used to convert a, det a detention facility or to create or lease a facility to be used as an alternative to, deten to detention. Um, so those are, I think, the bills that we're looking at here as far as CIP goes, but uh, we're gonna have a uh, panel of, of some uh, experts in the field, both child welfare and juvenile justice, and, and running those programs throughout the state that will come next. And I believe it's Judge Gendler is on. Yeah. I believe Judge Gendler, if, if you're on, uh, you are up first. Yeah, I'm on. Um, I just have three bills, and I'll be brief to leave time, hopefully, for questions from others. Uh, the first bill I'll talk about briefly is LB 670, which was introduced at the request of the Crime Commission. And I really have to thank Cindy Gans for going over this with me. Every group, by fe every state, excuse me, by federal law has to have what's called the state advisory group. So ours is the Nebraska Coalition. And historically, years ago, even when I was on it, there were hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal money distributed to the states uh, through the state advisory groups. That amount has dwindled down to just Title II funds. In our case, I think it's roughly a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. 
So our state has decided to opt out of the federal requirement. Uh, to my knowledge, Wyoming is the other state that's already done that. So what this bill does is essentially codify the coalition and the membership. Uh, and of note here, uh, a majority of the members cannot be employed by government, and at least a fifth of the members have to be under the age of 24. Uh, and then, of course, the other responsibility for the coalition is to review and distribute the community aid grants. And as part of this bill, there is going to be a, an effort, which has been ongoing historically, to expand diversion and make sure those are adequately funded. Um, so that is uh, 670. The other one I want to briefly talk about is LB 689. This was introduced by Senator Blood. Um, Last April, I think, there was a uh, Federal Court of Appeals decision, and in that case, a family had moved from another state, and the, their child had been adjudicated in juvenile court for a sexual crime. Uh, that state required registration. So when the child moved here, the State Patrol contacted the family and said that this child needed to register in Nebraska. Uh, so they took it up on appeal, and the Court of Appeals essentially said, no, the Nebraska law does not require uh, registration. So what Senator Blood has attempted to do is to codify that case in our code. Um, and she references uh, Section 29-4003, which, well, the entire section, but that Section 29-4003 identifies those crimes where an adult has to register. Um, then the last bill I want to talk about briefly here is LB 1086, which was introduced by Senator Wayne. It was one of the last bills introduced this session, and others may want to comment on this. Um, so in a juvenile court proceeding, uh, if someone thinks they may be the father, they can file a motion, and then they're entitled to have a DNA test to confirm that fact. Um, but the DNA test, and, and quite frankly, the cost of representation is borne by the father who seeks to intervene. Um, and I'm not sure what other jurisdictions do, but in our jurisdiction, first of all, the county attorney can allege that somebody's the father, and they're immediately a party to the action, and come in and have a right to uh, essentially disprove that fact. Uh, but if somebody comes into our system saying they're the father and there's reason to believe they are, we appoint them a lawyer and we get the DNA test paid for by the state. So while I like the idea here, the concern is that most of these fathers cannot afford a lawyer and they certainly cannot afford a DNA test. But the intent here is to make sure that they have a right to be heard. And again, that's LB 1086. And now I'll turn it over to the others. So up next, we have Lori Harder from DHHS. Um, I want to discuss LB uh, 863, which is the ADS grounds for termination of parental rights for juveniles who are under age three and have been out of home for placement of six months or longer. If the parent isn't working to remedy the situation, in order for the TPR to be filed under the provision, um, a parent must have substantially neglected or willfully refused to remedy the circumstances. Um, we're concerned that these requirements are vague and it is unclear uh, what would rise to the level of substantially neglecting um, someone or what would be considered a willful refusal. Um, we're concerned that the vague language would cause county attorneys or GALs to avoid filing the TPR. Um, we have questions about situations where there is a sibling group and only one of the children is under age three and the grounds for termination in that situation and we are with how this criteria would meet the active efforts um, of an ICWA case. Um, another bill that we had an interest in was LB um, 1046, which is to provide for a caseload ratio emergency declaration. Um, and that bill requires the department to consider and implement numerous options ranging from hiring CFS specialist staff reassignment, a review of active case duration cases and et cetera. Um, we have had several strategies and we are in the process of reallocating FTE to assist us in meeting the CWLA caseload requirements. 
um, as outlined by statutes. And then we recently were approved as a state for a QICWD project. We were one of eight states in the nation to uh, be approved for that research project. So um, we just want to make sure that those things are coordinated and efforts are not duplicated um, through that process and that we're not impeding um, those things unnecessarily. Um, there was a request for um, LB 1073 for us to provide additional information relating to foster care placements. Um, and our only comment about that, it was about whether um, the placement is a relative or kin, whether the home was licensed, if um, we had authorized a waiver for the placement, like training or family size, um, and what was the basis for the waiver. Um, and our only comment to that is that um, those, uh, we're not gathering those elements today um, through any information system, and so we would need to be making changes to our current electronic information system to be in compliance with those uh, requests. Um, but we are willing to, to look at that. And finally, LB 1041 is the bill that requires specific training for foster care licenses on sexual abuse. Um, it requires training on sexual abuse that covers the recognition of the risk to children that face this with regard to sexual abuse for foster parents who are licensed. The bill requires the training to consist of talking appropriately about boundaries with children, recognizing the signs of child abuse, and reacting to any sign or disclosure of the sexual abuse um, appropriately. So right now we use um, a method called TIPS MAP training for all of our foster parents through the uh, Adoptive and Foster Parent Association training, and we are working with them um, to evaluate how to uh, further our training in the area of sexual abuse and support for children. And that is all I have. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, now we're going to turn it over to Jeannie Brandner from the Administrative Office of Probation. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Jeannie Bradner, Deputy Administrator overseeing Juvenile Services. And I have just a few bills to discuss here this afternoon. Um, there are not huge implications to probation this legislative session with the exception of one potential. Um, so a couple of these are just good to know about and, and especially as national trends are talked about. First one is LB 732 is a bill from Senator Reapy. This just changed changes a due date for the Children's Commission report. It backs that due date up to September um, that, was for, that was previously due in December. And that is intentional for us to be able to get items in front of the legislature and have legislation for the next year if there is potential for that. I know that's something that we have uh, struggled with historically. LB 875, Senator Bowles removes, the, again, this does not directly impact juvenile probation, but it's very important on a national level. Many states are looking um, for these provisions, but removes the possibility of life without parole for juveniles who are charged as adults. And so there is lots of great information in that bill. LB 708. Senator Bowles looks at some cleanup. I don't know if anyone's talked about this yet um, from the bridge orders and uh, specifically removes the provision from district courts charging a fee for that processing of that bridge order. Um, LB 1101 is an interesting bill, again, not specifically impacting juvenile, but it looks at behavioral health rate increases, and this is connected to the adult justice reinvestment, and so we're always interested, especially with rates, is if we can tag along to something that looks at adult populations as well as for juvenile. Uh, LB 367 is a carryover bill from last year. That is uh, Senator Christ, and this is a transportation cleanup that would allow for some clarity surrounding um, once a youth is taken into temporary custody and a decision has been made that detention or a detention alternative is necessary, uh, who would be responsible for that transportation. That is currently an item that we have varying opinions about, especially in the greater Nebraska areas. Clearly, there is a there is an impact for law enforcement officers that would be doing that. Uh, LB 673 again is another cleanup provision from Senator Christ. 
This, um, there is one simple strike in this legislation that removes a statement that says an impartial person shall hold a hearing. Uh, there was some, that was old carryover language from OJS, and there was some confusion surrounding that, whether the judge ha was able to have that hearing. So that, that was a cleanup bill. And then LB1112, I think Matt discussed this earlier, but I did just want to clarify, this is Senator Vargas, Christ, and Pansy Brooks, that the main provision of this is it removes that harm to self as a reason for detention. And so again, I think that philosophically and on a national level, this is something that is absolutely necessary and we agree with 100%. I know that this has been tried in the past few years as well and there's been quite a bit of pushback about whether the system has services that are able to assist um, for populations, especially when we talk about trafficking victims and things of that nature. So again, not that I'm saying we should lock them up, I'm just talking about the past uh, system pushback that we have received. And then the last big one, probably the elephant in the room, is LB 927. This is Senator Howard's bill. This actually proposes to move certain juvenile justice functions back to pre-reform. Um, that Senator Ashford put into place so any youth that would have service needs would be served by the Department of Health and Human Service Child and Family Services. Clearly this is something that probation does not advocate for and uh, we are uh, going to be looking at that testimony. I don't, think, I don't think that that hearing has been scheduled yet, but I hear that it will be late in the session. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, so now we'll turn the presentation over to Sarah Helby from Nebraska Appleseed. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I just want to thank uh, CIP for the opportunity to participate today. Um, I wanted just to mention a few bills um, that were introduced in response to a special report um, of investigation issued in December of 2017 by the Office of Inspector General for Child Welfare um, on the sexual abuse of state wards and also youth and adoptive or guardianship homes and youth and residential placement. Um, the report detailed the investigation of 50 cases of sexual assault of children between the years 2013 and 2016 while they were in the state's care when they were placed in a home with adoptive parents or guardians by the state. Um, and there were several bills um, introduced this session that were intended to track recommendations from that report. Um, and the first two are ones that, that Lori also mentioned, so I'll just skim over them. Uh, again, LB 1041, introduced by Senator Wishart, um, would require Department of Health and Human Service to adopt and promulgate regulations regarding training for foster care licensees on sexual abuse um, and not to waive um, that training um, where non-safety licensing centers can be waived for relative homes. Um, and then another one that Lori Herter from me just also mentioned, um, is LB 1046, that's the caseload ratio emergency um, whenever HS is out of compliance with caseload uh, requirements for two consecutive calendar quarters and then requiring corrective action. Um, Senator Bowles also introduced a legislative resolution, LR 288, which would create um, the Nebraska Child Welfare Death and Abuse Special Oversight Committee of the legislature um, to study child deaths and abuse incident reports made alleging harm to children in the care of HHS and the actions taken in response, to, response and also policies and procedures in place regarding background checks um, and staff training and then the status of um, Office of Inspector General recommendations. And then that oversight committee would be required to issue a report with findings and recommendations, again, regarding child deaths and oversight uh, a legislative oversight committee regarding child deaths and abuse incident reports. Um, my understanding of the procedure of that is that it's been referred to the executive committee, um, and then if it gets out of committee, um, it requires a, a vote, the vote of the majority of the legislature. It doesn't go through the, the three stages of debate. Um, and then four other bills that were introduced related to the OIG report that I'll just mention but not discuss in depth due to time. LB 1073, I think, uh, Lori Harder also mentioned that, introduced by Senator Crawford, to provide additional foster care information, including whether the kinship placement's license and whether the placement received a waiver. Um, LB 1044, introduced by Senator Christ, would require HHS to provide social services to preserve a family without regard to whether the department or law enforcement is investigating the allegation. 
LB 1079 introduced by Senator Howard to change reporting requirements for children's residential facilities to include required investigations and report issued, essentially timelines on those investigations and reports of um, alleged violations of the Children's Residential Facilities uh, Act. And then LB 1078 introduced by Senator Crawford to require um, reporting of child, uh, se sexual abuse allegations to the Office of the Inspector General to include that in her jurisdiction. Um, so that's sort of the, I guess, the package in response to the OIG report. With my remaining time, I wanted to highlight um, LB 226, which is actually a carryover bill from last session, um, but I wanted to just call your attention to it because it just advanced out of Judiciary Committee um, with an amendment unanimously on Friday. So again, it's a bill from last session um, that it has, is, has moved forward out of committee this session, early this session. Um, it was introduced by Senator Wishart, and it's intended to increase access to driver's licenses for youth in care. Um, this is something at Appleseed we've heard as a big issue for many young people because access to driver's license is so important to help them pursue their goals related to work and education and also um, access to normalcy activities. LB226 would require HHS to provide information and assistance to obtain a driver's license as part of the transition planning process, including things like providing the youth with a copy of a driver's manual, um, identifying driver's ed courses and resources to access driver's ed, and identifying potential means to access a car for driver's ed. Um, it also requires HHS to provide youth age 14 and older or who enter foster care after attaining 14 with a certified copy of their birth certificate and social security card if they're eligible um, to assist them in obtaining a learner's permit or license. So under existing both federal and state law, HHS is required to provide these and other vital documents prior to youth prior to exiting care at 18 or 19. With this change would allow youth to get access to those documents when requested to access a driver's license. Um, the bill is also intended to encourage foster parents to help youth in their care access a driver's license. There has been some confusion about whether youth need to get a caseworker signature, but under existing statute, parental permission is not required for any youth. So the amendment clarifies that this is the same for foster youth. The bill would also provide liability protection for caregivers, uh, foster parents essentially, um, so similar to liability protection in existing federal and state law for caregivers making reasonable and prudent parent standard decisions, LB-226 clarifies that, foster, that caregivers are not liable for harm caused to or by a child who obtains the learner's permit or driver's license if the caregiver is acting within the reasonable and prudent parent standard. Um, and then finally, it also directs the, the Strengthening Families Act Committee of the Nebraska Children's Commission to examine the costs and benefits of implementing a program to help foster youth better access insurance, like maybe a type of um, insurance pool or some other states do that differently, um, because we know that this is often the bigger and more costly issue is insurance and access to insurance. This would bring together representatives from Department of Administrative Services, HHS, the Department of Transportation, and DMV to examine and make recommendations um, around that issue as well. Um, so the next step on this bill um, would be a waiting place on the agenda for general file um, and then uh, first round consideration by the full legislative body. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to the next presenter who I think is Juliet. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm just, uh, as you can hear, there are quite a few bills this session that pertain to kids in the courts in various ways. I'm only going to focus on two of them, so hopefully we'll have time for some um, for some questions about anything anyone has brought up today. Um, the first I'm going to talk about is LB 869. This is a bill from Senator Panzing Brooks, um, which updates our current statute around the sealing of juvenile records. Um, so, and it does this in, in several ways. So first, it extends our current statute to include both um, county and district court records when the case was ultimately transferred to juvenile court. It implements a process for automatic sealing of records when an adjudicated youth has successfully completed the orders of the court, uh, whether that's probation, diversion, treatment, or a sentence of incarceration if the youth is in uh, adult criminal court. It changes plain language to developmentally appropriate language in the notice that county attorneys must give to juveniles about our sealing records statute. Uh, it sets up a clear statutory process by which a juvenile who has not had his or her record sealed um, automatically or otherwise, um, that they can move the court to request sealing later. 
So this can be done by either the, the youth or his or her parent or guardian. It can be done at the age of majority or six months after the case has closed, whichever happens sooner. And the bill uh, sets out obligations for who has to receive notice of this filing, which is essentially any party to the case. Um, if one of those parties wishes to object to the motion, the bill requires that that response uh, include a rationale based on statutory factors supported by a factual basis that essentially points to that the juvenile has not been sufficiently rehabilitated. Uh, and those factors um, are the behavior of the youth after, after the disposition, adjudication, diversion, or sentence, and the youth's response to that diversion, mediation, probation, supervision, or other treatment or program or sentence. Um, the education and employment history of the youth and any other circumstances relating to the rehabilitation of the youth is sort of the big bucket category. Uh, at the hearing, the court then considers those factors, and the bill says that the court shall order the record sealed if it finds by a preponderance of the evidence that the youth has been rehabilitated to a satisfactory degree. Um, that court order also must be in developmentally appropriate language and it must include the contact information for the government agencies that will be subject to that order. So I think an intent for the, the youth or their family to be able to follow up and ensure that, that the records uh, all along the way actually get sealed. Um, if the court does not order that the record be sealed, the statute then, or the bill then permits the youth to try again one year later. And finally, it, uh, it sets out sort of an enhanced sealing process um, or status after five years have passed from the initial sealing of the record. Uh, and, and what that is, is it basically cuts down the list of people or entities that are listed in uh, 43-2108.05 that can have access to a sealed record. It cuts, there's kind of a laundry list in there right now of people who have you know, valid reasons to, to look at an otherwise sealed record. Um, so after five years, the, the bill would cut down that list to just three. So the individual whose record is at issue and anyone that they authorize to look. So, you know, if, if they're trying to join the military or an employer or college is requiring it, they're allowed to, to authorize that. Um, persons engaged in bona fide research authorized by the court or the state court administrator, um, and, but with provisions protecting confidentiality of the individual whose record would be looked at. Uh, and the Inspector General for Nebraska Child Welfare pursuant to an investigation. And then this bill also applies retroactively. So that's LB 869. Um, the other one I'm going to talk about is LB 870, also a Senator Panzing Brooks bill. Uh, and this is a bill of, about room confinement, uh, also known as solitary confinement or segregation or isolation. So uh, what this bill does is it sort of takes a next step from a prior bill that Senator Panzing Brooks had in, in 2016, LB 894, which required that all juvenile facilities in the state, so facilities where, where young minors are, are housed, um, it, that pre previous bill was a reporting requirements bill. So um, all those facilities had to report to the Inspector General about their uses of room confinement, um, which was defined in statute um, and as a youth placed involuntarily alone in a room or cell during normal waking hours. Um, and so this bill, um, this bill, like I said, takes the next step specifically with regard to our state and county-run facilities. So this bill this year does not apply to private placements though the current reporting requirements would still apply to those. And LB 870 this year says that room confinement, as defined by statute that I just described, can only be used when the youth poses an immediate and substantial risk of harm to self or others, and all other less restrictive alternatives have been exhausted. Um, it sets out a list of inappropriate uses of, uses of room confinement, which include punishment or disciplinary sanction, um, a staffing shortage or retaliation by staff. And then for those youth who are still placed into solitary confinement, uh, it pro provides some additional protection. So they can only be kept in there long enough to eliminate the risk of harm presented. So i.e. for, you know, for a cool off period, if, you know, staff is, is having them in there due to some risk of harm, you know, a fight or something like that in the general population. 
uh, they can't be kept in solitary for a length of time that would, quote, compromise their mental or physical health. Um, and I think this one is a, maybe perhaps a little redundant with a further protection I'll go into in a minute. They shall have the same access as the general population to meals, contact with parents or guardians, legal assistance, and access to educational programming. So if you're in room confinement during a normal meal time, you're getting a meal, you're still able to call your parents or guardians, you're still able to contact your attorney to the extent that anyone else in the general population is able to. And then additionally, sort of beyond that, it also requires that youth in room confinement have access to appropriate medical and mental health services promptly provided, and access to drinking water, toilet facilities, hygienic supplies, and reading materials that have been approved by a licensed mental health professional. Um, additionally, it requires that anyone in room, any juvenile in room confinement should be continuously monitored by facility staff um, for safety. And additionally, that the rooms, uh, there's some requirements about the rooms having adequate lighting, heating, cooling, ventilation, and be clean and resistant to suicide or self-harm. And then the final piece, um, which I sort of uh, alluded to earlier, is that if the youth is not cooling down in solitary confinement, if the, if the threat is not going away, that threat of, of immediate harm to self or others for which they were placed into solitary confinement, then the facility, the bill gives the facility a time limit for figuring out some other solution to the problem. So if the threat presented is to others, the bill allows the facility three hours before the youth has to be either returned to the general population, transferred to a medical unit, transferred to a mental health facility that would be appropriate to giving services, or, or offered some kind of specialized plan for programming to address whatever that threat is. Um, and then for youth who present a risk of harm to self, that's cut down to just 30 minutes. I think out of a, a concern for the significant mental health damage that solitary confinement itself can create. Um, I will say the bill also requires notice to the youth's parent or guardian and the attorney of record when placed into solitary confinement or if that provision is, is taken advantage of to transfer to a mental health facility. And it also prohibits using consecutive periods of room confinement to avoid the spirit and purpose of the bill's provisions. Um, and I understand that there is also an amendment the Senator is going to offer the committee tomorrow, which would provide further clarification that this piece of the, of the statute, the bill, only applies to our state and local, uh, locally run institutions and also adding that the court of record will receive notice along with the parent and the lawyer. Um, oh, and the last thing, I know we only have five more minutes, I did just want to provide another perspective on LB uh, 1112, Senator Vargas's bill. Just to clarify, I, I think um, it's actually mostly about secure detention in county facilities rather than YRTC commitment. So it does on the first page poll language about YRTC out of one paragraph to separate it from detention, um, but then it doesn't change any of the current statutory requirements set out uh, later in statute uh, that happened during LB 561 about what has to be proved in order to commit a youth to YRTC. Most of what the bill would change, the statutory language pertains to secure detention rather than to YRTC commitment. So just a clarification on that. And uh, with that, I just want to say thank you again to the Court Improvement Project for hosting this webinar and giving me the opportunity to share. And I will turn it back over to them. I'm muting. Thanks so much, Julia. Um, Jeannie just wanted to give a quick update on some budget um, perspectives of probation. So I'm going to turn it back over to her. Yes, I forgot the most important part. What is the budget impact? Um, we are looking, just like other entities, at a, an additional 2% reduction this year. This is branch-wide, so courts and probation, and 4% next fiscal year. How that relates to what everybody's most concerned about is service. Um, we are doing our best to protect those services at this point. With those given reductions, we will not have to eliminate service, reduce rates, or any other mechanism to make up for that budget difference. But again, as these things ebb and flow, we continue to watch the budget discussions and, and again, advocate for not having that impact services. And I know I had mentioned hoping to tie on to some of those rate increases. Again, not sure that they will go somewhere given the budget con 
constraints that we have within the state, but right now probation is looking okay for services. And Lori, I didn't know if you had any different perspective for child welfare services. And thanks, Jeannie. I don't, actually. Okay, great. Um, so now we'd like to just open it up for questions. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, feel free to type them in the chat and we will read them out or you can unmute your line and ask a question directly as well. Okay, it doesn't really look like we're getting any questions. Um, so like Deb mentioned, we will have a follow-up webinar. It's tentatively scheduled for April 27th um, post-session to talk about um, what bills have actually passed and what that means uh, for our system. So watch for that. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for everyone um, who logged in and listened in, and a special thank you to all our presenters who offered um, their expertise and perspective on the legislative session. And I think with that, we'll sign off. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>